Well, our church is about two things primarily, to magnify God, to multiply disciples. And I believe we have certainly magnified the, 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 the glory of God today. For the series that we've been in, kind of focusing on our three primary uh, pathways, if you will, that we're going to live as a worshiper. What does it mean to really magnify God in our life and to live as a worshiper? Secondly, we love as a community. You know, how do we love one another? But it doesn't just stay with us. How do we lead as a servant the rest of the world to Christ? It is essential that we get to a place where uh, what God is doing in us begins to overflow from us and goes uh, not just to our neighbors, not just across the street, but through literally around uh, the world. The, the, the focus I'm going to have today is this, lead as a servant by spreading the gospel around the world. And we get this thought right from scripture as Jesus, before he ascended back to heaven, said this in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. WLBC has always been, we have a 116-year history of being a, a mission-focused church, a church that prays for the lost around the world, a, a church that gives financially so that others may go and, and reach those around the world. And we also have a focus of sending that we may go. We pray, we give, and we go. And as you're able and uh, God is calling, we want to send people all over the world. You know, just yesterday, you may think, well, did, you know, are we doing world missions? Have we done that lately? Because, you know, air traffic has just been crazy over the last couple of years. Any travel? Uh, yes, yesterday, 35 people gathered together in the fellowship hall and packed 324 boxes for Operation Christmas Child. And Linda tells me those boxes go all over the world, not only with the supplies that are in there, but a gospel uh, track that's in there that's going to communicate to those families. There was world missions going on yesterday. You know, right behind the wall, which I, I'm speaking out in the parking lot, there's a bus uh, that's sitting there. It's a bus that you have an opportunity to look at. We don't own that bus. Sonny Merriman was so uh, kind to uh, allow us to have it on our, our property today so that uh, you can take a look at it. Because that bus, if we choose to purchase that bus, will help us. seniors go on trips. It'll help our uh, children get to camp. And it's going to send some teenagers to Philadelphia this summer uh, to do missions. You know, to have a good vehicle to get them there safe, but to also be able to carry their luggage. But we want to reach people outside of Lynchburg, and that bus can help us do so. This morning, we're going to have two of our members who have recently been overseas share with you. Dr. Russ Melton recently went uh, to Kenya, one of my, my heart countries. I love to go to Kenya. And then Dr. Angela Ripley will be sharing her recent trip to Rwanda. And so I want you to give your undivided attention to hear uh, of their experience, see their pictures, and pray about how you may be called to go someplace, somewhere under God's provision. Welcome Dr. Russ Melton as he comes up. osteopathic medicine and I was able to go about a month ago to Kenya to a place called Kajabi the uh, we're gonna hit a slide I think so I can so uh, I had the opportunity about 17 years ago to go to Kajabi with Sue and our kids and this is actually the picture of our kids 17 years ago they're all grown up now and at Kajabi is a, has a compound around the hospital so when you go there there's housing you can stay at and each of the houses has this gate for safety that you lock um, and, uh, at, in the, at night. And uh, so this is the kids behind the gate. Um, so that was 17 years ago. And then uh, a month ago, I took a different set of kids. And these, are my, these are my kids for the last, uh, last month, the, uh, which are students from Liberty, from the med school that went with me. And let me tell you a little bit about Kajabi. The, uh, you can keep going. The, uh, uh, it is uh, at about 7,000 feet on what we would call maybe a big ridge overlooking the Great Rift Valley. This is the Great Rift Valley. They tell me it's so big you can see it from space. And uh, so it's pretty high up. 
Uh, interesting medical fact, it's so high up that if you stay up there, you don't have to worry about malaria, which is a big deal in Kenya because uh, the malaria parasite doesn't work at that elevation. Um, uh, Kajabi the, uh, um, has things instead of squirrels running around, you see monkeys running around. Uh, so it's a little bit different. And I know when we were there last time, one of them climbed in the window and surprised Sue and the kids while I was at work. Um, uh, it, uh, keep going. The, uh, and so Kajabi was started about over 100 years ago by African Inland Mission. And this is the African Inland Church, the church there. And so we were able to go to the church when we were there. The, uh, um, they have two services on Sunday. They have the first one um, in Swahili. I mean, I'm sorry, the first one in English and the second one in Swahili. And of course, we went to the English one. The, uh, it's a lot like our church. I always love going to church in other countries. It reminds me of just heaven, worshiping with different believers. And uh, they sing a lot of the songs we do, except their worship team dances a little more when they're up there. The, um, uh, but really enjoyed that. And we got to sit down and have chai with the pastor afterwards. This is a coffee shop. They, because they also have a Bible college there that has a coffee shop, and I never went to it, but the students went to it. This is one of our students with some of the Kenyan students uh, that was there uh, that we're working in the hospital with. Uh, and so let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, Kajabi Hospital. So Kajabi Hospital, again, was started over 100 years ago. I think of it like a UVA or a Duke in East Africa uh, because people come there from everywhere. The, uh, um, it's a fairly big place. Um, Kajabi is about an hour outside of Nairobi, so it's not in the city. It's more out in the country kind of thing. Um, but it has a big compound, and there's doctors there from multiple different uh, places. When we were there 17 years ago, my son had his birthday party there, and he had kids there from like five continents because there are doctors there from Asia and Australia and Britain. Um, so, the, uh, the different doctors from mission organizations that work there. Um, people come there from all over. This is a Maasai um, chief that's wearing actually a lion's mane on his, on his head and a couple of our students with him. They, we were able to visit a Maasai village while we were there, but uh, people come there from all over, um, all over Kenya and even outside of Kenya from Somalia, which borders Kenya. So, and the reason is because Kajabi, uh, does things that other places don't do. They do a lot of surgery, like uh, uh, working with hydrocephalus in children, cleft palates, club feet, things like that that people can't get other places. And so the, uh, they come from all over to Kajabi. So it's really interesting to be there and see all the people, uh, you, you know, from being here in Lynchburg and where I was before, which is a small town, it's very different to see people from just all over the country and different countries. And, um, some of the Muslim uh, women that are come that, you know, you only see their eyes. The, uh, so there's a great variety of people that come. And the main, so 15 or 17 years ago when I went, we went to serve for about five weeks there and I worked in the hospital uh, quite a bit. And when I came back now, it's quite a bit different. It's a lot bigger actually, because they really have done a great job of training Kenyans. I worked along a lot of, alongside a lot of Kenyan doctors. The last time I was there, I think there was one Kenyan doctor there. Now I worked alongside of many Kenyan doctors as well as training what they call clinical officers, which would be sort of like physician's assistants to us. And so I was able to work with training many of those and really enjoyed that. And then our students were able to work in multiple areas as well. And the main reason I went this time versus last time was to go with the students. Um, and you can flip through the, the next few slides with the students. They got to work in uh, casualty, which was what we would call the ED, the emergency department. They call it casualty. They got to work inpatient. Um, this is one of our students looking at a CT scan. And the, uh, they actually, when I was there before, they didn't have a CT scanner, but they do now. Um, and they got to work in the uh, PICU for the, for the children that were very sick. And then this is uh, one of our students working in the NICU. We're uh, practicing on neonatal resuscitation after a baby is born that's in distress. So they really got to do a lot of different things and, and have, have a lot of different uh, experiences, which is great medically. Uh, but the real reason that we go is exposure to missions from that standpoint, to not only help, but also get the students a chance to exposure to missions. We go with Samaritan's Purse, 
which are the same people that do the shoe boxes. They are an excellent organization. They have a medical arm called World Medical Mission, who I went with last time and we went with again this time, and they're great to work with. They work all over the world. The, uh, and these students that go with us are students who really have an interest in missions, and they really have a heart for that. And so the way I think of it is this is a chance for them to, to fan the flame of missions in their heart. What is God calling them to do long-term, short-term things, long-term things? This is a chance for them to experience this uh, for a month and work alongside long-term medical missionaries and see what it's like. And so that's one of the big reasons we go and do this. So they get great medical experience, but also get a great missions experience. Um, from my standpoint, uh, you know, like I said, this time I went to be with the students and, and help with that. But from Kajabi as a whole, one of their mottos is, we treat God heals. And, you know, the, the, that's the real reason we go is to share God's life with other people. I'll share you just a really quick story about the last time I was there, something I'll never forget, the, uh, in working with the people and things, I got to meet one of the chaplains. So they have multiple chaplains. Um, these people that come speak all different languages. Many of them speak three languages. They speak their tribal language, they speak Swahili, and they speak English, but they speak British English. And so a lot of times they can't understand my Southern American English. The, uh, but uh, so a lot of times we have translators and things. Uh, but also, like I said, we have people from Somalia that speak other languages. And so they actually have chaplains that speak a lot of these languages, including Somali. And so uh, one of the Somali chaplains, I was interested in talking to him. And I'm like, you know, did you grow up Muslim? Because there's not many Christians in Somalia. And he said, yes, I did. And I'm like, I want to buy you a Coke and hear your story. So we sat down and I said, you know, tell me about this. And the thing I'd like to share with you, you know, he gave me a longer story, but he basically said, you know, what, what happened to me was I grew up Muslim, you know, I did all the right things. But when I did all the right things, even with that, when it came to the end of my, end of my life, when I stood before God, it would be like, am I going to get in? I'm not sure. Maybe I did enough. Maybe I didn't do enough. You know, a lot of maybes there. And he said, and I heard about Christianity and I heard about Jesus and the assurance. And he said, that's what drew me, the assurance that when my life was over, I was assured through what Jesus did of heaven. And that's what really drew me. And I, that, that really made me remember that. And, and that's the reason we go to share the assurance we have, that hope in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melton. Now, welcome Dr. Angela Ripley, who will come share about Rwanda. So I actually have to start with uh, what Pastor Chris said, because it goes very much along with something I want to share with you. And he just talked about Acts um, 1, 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, one of the biggest things I, wanna, I want you to remember from my sharing today is just the power. And I'll touch on that in a minute. But as you can see on the screen, Imana Ishimwe. That is Kenna Rwanda for God be praised. And if TJ is watching in Oregon, this is for her. Um, she practiced this over and over and we would joke her and she would say it seven times. Imana Ishimwe, Imana Ishimwe. So it's drilled into my head and I just love that. Uh, some of you may remember um, back in 2019, I went to Rwanda on a mission trip and stood on this very stage and thanked you all for the support in all the ways. And I'm just so excited to be back. And again, with a super filled, thankful heart. And first, I just wanna say thank you. Um, thank you to Jesus for the opportunities that you provide for all of us to partner in building your kingdom, God. We just thank you so much for that. And I thank you, West Lynchburg, for loving Jesus, loving people, and doing that through missions. Um, it's incredibly hard for me to stand here and try to summarize my most recent Rwandan experience. So bear with me trying to get through my reading, but um, I just returned a couple weeks ago and I'm going to try to share a snippet with you, and um, 
like I said, there are three things. The snippet I share with you, remember it or not, what I want you to remember is one word, power, and the three facets with power. I want you to remember that the power, there is power in his name, Jesus, and there is power in prayer, and third, there is power in the Holy Spirit. And goodness, when they all come together, it's just, it's breathtaking. Um, we recognize, um, when we recognize and actually believe in the power that is in Jesus' name and pray in his Holy Spirit to work in and through us, he moves. And he moves in the mighty in your face kind of ways. But my personal favorite is when he moves in those minute, seemingly unrelated details that eventually all add up to make this intricate, elaborate, and profound story of the power of Jesus. I could go on and on about all the divine appointments and God moments that I had on the trip and my 11 other team members from Oregon had, but if, I, if you've been on a trip like this, you know that I might be here for a week. So I want to do my best to focus on some highlights. My team and I went to Rwanda representing Apple of His Eye Charity which is based out of Oregon. Apple of Azai provides holistic sponsorships for children and their families in India and in Rwanda. These are monthly sponsorships providing funds to meet basic needs like medical treatment, education, vocational training, uh, finances to go towards businesses, to start a business for the family or buy a home for the family. Prior to our trip in February, Apple of Azai had 66 kids that were sponsored through their Rwanda sponsorship program. And many of those children and families were visited during our trip. And I got to be a part of some of those home visits. And during those home visits, you can see here in the picture that we were able to give out some backpacks, toys, clothes, different school supplies. And um, the, the school supplies that I was a part of handing out were from the sponsors back home. I just got the privilege of giving it to the kiddo and getting the hug and the smile in return. Some were visited in their schools, but some, uh, some were also visited in their schools that, where they get a Christian education, which is through that sponsorship program. And during many of the home visits, while we were out in the villages, people in the villages overheard about the sponsorship program. And they would ask, how do I get my kids sponsored? How do I be a part of that? Because they could see what was happening and they could see the support and the love that they, those other children were getting. So due to our group's presence there in the villages, 35 additional kids were added to the sponsorship program and are currently being sponsored now. So Apple of Azai went from 66 kids sponsored to presently 101, 101 kids, and that could have changed in the last few days since I got that report back from them. So those kids are now getting a Christian education. They're participating in a weekly Saturday program where they are provided meals, teachings about Jesus, and even a bunch more. During that Saturday program, it's called, well, that Saturday program is called the Muzuma program. So Muzuma is Kinner Rwandan for come alive, and that's their native language there. And during those Saturday times, we were able to distribute backpacks, which had dental hygiene supplies, and then the, the 15 pounds of soap that Linda Melton donated for my trip, <laughs> it took up quite a bit of weight in my bags, but I was so glad to figure out getting that in there. I was able to take three bags, and most of you probably know they cannot go over 50, and two of the ba bags were 50 pounds, and one was 49. So I was very thankful <laughs> to my mother and all the people who donated things, and my mom helping me pack that. Uh, additionally, we were in, while we were in country, we were able to purchase 26 bicycles and then distribute them among a bunch of these sponsored kids so then they would have a way to get to and from school. And there's a picture of one of the, the kiddos getting his bike. So Apple of His Eye partners with Hope Vocational Training Center, which is based in Rwanda. And the center was started by Pastor Emmanuel Sataki. Emmanuel is a 1994 genocide survivor with an incredible story of how God saved him and has been guiding him to help rebuild his home country. I think you need to go to the next slide because I want you guys to see. So Pastor Emmanuel is in this picture in the back and that's his mother and his aunt. And really quick snippet, the book that they're holding is a journal that Carol and Fox made and the women's group here were able to write prayers in. So it was super special to be able to see her again after two years and just deliver this 
this prayer journal that was beautiful, and I think it meant a ton to Pastor Emmanuel as well. But I am really excited also because Pastor Emmanuel will be here next week, and I have been praying for a few years since I went in 2019 for him to be able to come and personally share his story with our congregation here. So just I pray that all of you will come back next week and hear his story and just be here in his support because he, he's well aware of how much this church has supported me. My church and my family has supported me to come. So the Vocational Training Center provides Rwandan youth whose families are stuck in the cycle of poverty the opportunity to learn one of five different trades, which include sewing skills, culinary skills, masonry skills, hairdressing, and welding. They also have a computer class and a business class to prep these students to go out into the workforce and use these new skills. The training center director, Lewis, is someone I met two years ago on my first trip. And the last day of my first trip, we were at the airport and he and I were just talking and he realized I was a physical therapist. And then he, leads, he proceeds to tell me that he has a family friend who has a kiddo with, well, he wasn't sure what it was at the time, but he, she couldn't walk and talk and she was three. I, I, to my understanding, she has cerebral palsy. But in talking with him, he was just, can you please come back? So of course I'm like, I wanna come back. Let me pray about this. And I was super hopeful for a return to go back to Rwanda. And then the opportunity came to come this time. When I arrived back in Rwanda in February at the training school, Lewis and I had a chance to meet and he informed me of eight young adults with disabilities enrolled in the various vocational programs at the school. And I had been praying for years for another Rwandan experience so I could use my physical therapy skills. Uh, and it was very eager to meet these students. Over the next few days, I had the opportunity to talk with each individual, hear their stories, build relationship, and provide some minor therapy education, and find out, most importantly, if they believed in Jesus. The first seven students I met with they knew Jesus as their savior. Those students had extra challenges from experiencing a stroke, leg amputation from the genocide, and burn contractures to both hands where they couldn't open their hands. And believe it or not, that student with the hands was in the welding program. So two of the students that I also met were deaf, which some of you know my brother is deaf, so that's near and dear to my heart. But it was amazing to be able to spend time with those students and share with them the deaf Bible so they could access the Bible. And the girl that I showed it to is just, you could see her face like, oh my gosh, now I can follow this and understand. So that was really amazing. Um, when I had a chance to meet with the last student in that group that had disabilities, she expressed that she knew who Jesus was because she was Muslim. So the stage was set. I was building relationship, getting to know her story and doing some physical therapy with her. And next, all I had to do was tell her the Jesus that we know as the son of God and let God do the rest. That day she accepted Christ, which was pretty amazing to see the physical therapy come with Christ and just all of that culmination was quite an experience. In addition to her, 59 other people accepted Christ as their savior for the first time during our trip through uh, another pastor preaching and other church or other moments of evangelism. So that seems all excellent and seems like a place, a good place for me to stop talking, but there's a little bit more. <laughs> In addition to those young adults, Lewis, the director of the training school, wanted me to work with uh, a few students or a few kids that he knew in the community. One of those was that little girl he mentioned to me in 2019 and her name was Yada. And there she is on the screen. So I had the opportunity to do physical therapy with her in her home and her mom. And I actually did some physical therapy with her mom because she was having back pain from caring for Yada. So I worked with her and then I had two other students, another one or two other kids, one with cerebral palsy and then another one with autism. And all of those children were treated in their homes. Though I have many years of experience working as a physical therapist, God laid on my heart during this trip the idea of people with disabilities often being the forgotten of the forgotten. Those with disabilities, specifically physical and cognitive, and their families are often confined to their homes and can be easily disregarded by the community. It was an honor to help them feel seen, feel valued, and have hope again 
But not in me, obviously. That was in our creator. Since returning home, Yada's dad messaged me and said, you've been like an angel for us. You gave us hope again, end quote. To me, that's the power of Jesus. So thank you, or Marikuze in Kenner, Rwanda, to my family here, my, my immediate family, my aunts and uncles, West Lynchburg, you all are my family, uh, for being my angels, lifting me up and empowering me to, to simply go. Because of you who supported me prayerfully, financially, providing supplies, and simply being a part of the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit is being felt and received by many Rwandans. His Holy Spirit's power is wrapping this earth through us all and is moving across generations, geography, and through each of our hearts. When we recognize and believe in the power that is in Jesus, in his name, the prayer for his Holy Spirit to work in and through us, just wait and watch the intricate, elaborate, and profound story of the power to be revealed to you. Again, I want you to remember power power in his name, power in prayer, and then power in the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Acts 1.8. Are we all in? You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. We started with Acts 1.8. How many of you have ever been on a mission trip, either uh, in the United States or internationally? It, there's nothing like it. How many of you have plans to go on a, a, a mission trip, either in the United States or internationally, in the next year or two? Oh, it doesn't match. But all of us can pray, all of us can give, all of us can go. We started with Acts 1-8. I want you to open your Bibles briefly to Acts 8-1. We'll just flip those numbers around. I'm a little dyslexic today. But I think they're connected. You'll see this in the text. I just want to uh, mention just a few things out of this passage that I think will be helpful. If you've got a bulletin, there's a little note-taking, so I'll hit all three points just so I don't frustrate the A-type personalities in the room. But if we're going to spread the gospel around the world, what does that require? Let me give you just a few things from this text. First, it, it, you know, I'm talking about being all in. You know, Jesus gave the command. It wasn't a suggestion. It's something that all of us, his, his body, all of the believers, the followers of Christ, will embrace and be all in about. Not just all in personally, but all of us are in uh, the mission to spread the gospel around the world. And, and in verse 1, at chapter 8, it says, And Saul approved of his execution. You know, they, they were killing Stephen just in the um, uh, chapter 7. Stephen was the first martyr arrested basically for speaking the gospel, but they claimed that he was speaking against the temple and against the law. And all in here was that he was all in even if they were going to kill him. And they did. They stoned him. You know, that's another thing to say, you know, in a sense, when we're all in with spreading the gospel, are we all in with our entire life? That even to the point of death, not that I don't believe either of our two uh, speakers today were in, in harm's way uh, from persecution. But there are missionaries right now as we speak in lands that uh, they could be killed for spreading the gospel. Are we all in, even to the point of, of death, when facing death? Are we all in, even when we're being displaced? I want you to notice the rest of the verse. And there uh, arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. I mean, one man is dead, and now the rest of the church is under great persecution. And it says, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. It's interesting here that Stephen's martyrdom brought a great persecution. And the great persecution brought a great dispersion. And all except for the apostles, and the great dispersion led to worldwide evangelism. Up to that point, they were just in Jerusalem, uh, uh, sharing with one another, meeting house to house. But the gospel was to go outside of their region. And it was, in Jesus had already said, you're going to be in Jerusalem, and then you're going to move out to Judea and Samaria, and then you're going to go out to the ends of the world. And so here, they, at this point, had not spread out to Judea and Samaria. What made them do that? The persecution. When the persecution goes up, evangelism spreads wider. Acts 8.1. And Acts 1-8 are intricately connected. 
the power of the Spirit is magnified most often in persecution because you have to be all in for that to happen. Certainly, the gospel around the world requires being all in with your life. It also requires being all in with your love. I want you to notice verse 2. There's a few areas here I find that they're completely in love. And this is why the gospel spreads. Now, uh, in verse 2, it says, Devout men buried Stephen and make great lamentation over him. They are brokenhearted because they love Stephen. He lived out his faith even to the point of death, and they were brokenhearted. But it shows the deep love they had for one another. There's a love for each other. Great loss. I, I want you to get this. Don't miss this. What's the greatest way they can show love to Stephen after he's gone? Not merely crying, but living like he lived. He was willing to die for his faith. Some of you have had love, loved ones that are gone. They've, they've passed. And certainly, recalling their memory is an important thing, but if they were living for Jesus, you want a great way to love them and honor them? Then live the way they lived for Jesus. If they shared their faith, live that out and you share your faith. If they were the one always consistent and accountable to, to people and say, man, you need to grow in your faith. They were discipling people. Become a discipler like they were. You want to love one another? Then become like Jesus as you see it in one another. The legacy people leave is essential that we grab onto it, not as a memory, but as a model. They loved one another. I, I see here in verse 3, they loved the church. I mean, great persecution is happening, and this is the opportunity people can say, well, I'm out. I'm not all in. I'm not going to be with the church anymore because you could be killed for this. And you notice what happens in verse 3. It says, but, Paul, uh, but Saul, who later becomes Paul, Saul was ravishing the church. That's the Greek word for ravages. To, to, it, to, it, it was used in the Septuagint. Some of you Greek scholars, Septuagint, the Old Testament translation into Greek, the same word is used for ripping apart boars, or, or boars would rip this apart. Saul's going into house churches and ripping it apart. They were dragging off men and women and committed to put them in prison. Why did Saul go house to house? Because that's where their people were gathering. And they knew it. And you notice they love the church enough to still gather with the church. You know, there's people in China right now that, uh, where the church is not legal if they're going to teach the true gospel. And they're in house churches gathered around. But they're not fearful to go even if the government were to come in and try to rip them out. I'm still a believer and I'm still going to follow God. I'm still going to worship. They loved each other and they loved the church. This is all in. We're, we're not going to hide in our closets. We're going to be together wherever God uh, allows us to gather. And you notice in verse 4, there's a love for the word of God. This is how they're all in with their love. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. You would think they would be silent now. I could be killed for my faith. I could be killed for gathering with Christians. I could be killed for speaking the word because they just killed my, my, my dear friend and my brother in Christ, Stephen. But I'm all in with my life. I'm all in with my love. I'm going to preach and speak the word of God regardless of what happens because this world is not my home. When I sell out to God, if, he, if, if it's his will, I'll remain to live as Christ. And if he takes me out because of the persecution of the people, then I'll go right to heaven and be in his presence. Either way, it's a gain. To live as Christ, to die is gain. You talk about spreading the gospel where people are putting their, their life in harm's way. They do it because they love eternal life more than they love their own life. They love that people could know Jesus for eternity if they're willing to sacrifice. And you notice Saul is the one ripping people out of their homes. He saw enough Christians until one day he's walking down the road and Jesus encounters him, and he's not unaware of Jesus, and he becomes converted. You realize sometimes those who persecute will be the ones, when you're faithful to your, to, to your faith, when you're faithful to Jesus, the ones who persecute you may be the first converts come out of your testimony and your witness. They loved the word of God. I love the word uh, 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 scattered here. It, it's it's diasporan. You know, there are three words for being scattered. First is Scorpio, which means to be blown with the wind aimlessly. There's another one called Ritzo. Uh, it's hurled about like scattered sheep without a shepherd. But diaspora is where we get the word diasporan. This word being used right here is the, to spread like a seed so it may be planted. When God spreads us, 
It's because it's not just unintentional, just go wherever. It's that you're going because you're going to be spreading a seed that will be planted and it will bring growth. The persecution increased. Evangelism did too. One thing I do want you to notice though, through the book of Acts where the church is being started, from Acts 1 to Acts uh, chapter 8, the, the whole movement's being led by the apostles appointed by Jesus. But I want you to know and I want you to see it here very clearly. The first missionaries outside of Jerusalem were not the apostles. Go back to verse, verse 1. And there arose on that day great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Except the apostles. The greatest movement of God outside of Jerusalem was not started by the leaders of the church. They were started by the people in the pews. God's plan is always fulfilled by the people in the pews, not by the leaders. Thank you, one person. I think that ought to take a lot of people going, I'm all in. Absolutely. I mean, listen, this is the word of God speaking to every one of us. We always go, well, we've got missionaries and we've got pastors and, and we've got people. No, God uses the church, all of us, to accomplish worldwide evangelism. The professionals, I'm thankful that God calls people out to make this their career. But most often, the greatest impacted by those just sitting there, normal lives. I'm a doctor, I'm a teacher, I'm a stay-at-home mom, whatever. And then God says, I want you to go and spread the gospel wherever you go. And God brings revival. You know, Satan here, in chapter 7, I'm convinced, he, he thought, I'll smother that gospel by persecution. We'll kill Stephen. It'll kill the whole movement. And the Satan thinks it, that he has squelched and stopped God's plan. God used what Satan was doing to fulfill his plan. I love that. It's like when Satan, I, I just guarantee Satan's thinking, yes, Jesus is dead. He's crucified. He's done. I won. And then the veil rips in the temple. <laughs> and, 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 and the earthquake's taking place. And dead bodies are rising out of the graves. And three days later, Jesus is walking around. Satan thought he had won and he had been defeated. He thought he had won in chapter 7. And he had been defeated by the church as they go. And they're not silent. They're speaking the gospel and loving those they encounter. That is exciting to me. Because what happens in chapter 8, verse 1, can happen today. Don't worry about the persecution and, and those who would oppose. Just trust in the power, in the name of God, in prayer, and in the Spirit of God to enable His people to spread the gospel. And even in our day, when we're having so many tragedies, so many complications out the world, that the greatest revival that has ever been seen is before us. And you can be a part. I guarantee it. The church grew when the gospel advanced because the people were all in with their life, with their love. And lastly, let me just share with you, they're all in with their Lord. That's really where it boils down to. I like Charles Spurgeon when he said, we have a great need for Christ and we have a great Christ for our need. Our need in our day, our need for our world in this day is Jesus Christ. And we can take it and spread it. Plant that seed. I want you to notice there are just a couple of things if you write down the notes. Verse 5, because Christ is central and they're all in with their Lord, Christ was central to the preaching because he is truth. Philip said, uh, he's taken this, uh, and this is not Philip from, uh, from earlier in the New Testament. He's really uh, fairly unknown. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. He went to Samaria and lived his faith out loud. Oh, how we need more Christians to live their faith out loud. And this is fairly a bold move. You realize, you know, even in the day of Jesus, John chapter 4, Jesus uh, said I, he had to go to Samaria. This was the, uh, the half-breeds is what the Jewish people would call them. They're half-Gentile, half-Jew, intermarried. People, Jews would avoid the place. And here, Philip says, I'm going to go right to Samaria, just like Jesus did. Just like Jesus spoke to the woman at the well and, and, and led her uh, to faith in him. I'm going to go right there too, and I'm going to preach out loud. I may be rejected, I may be persecuted, but I'm going to spread the gospel and see what God does. If God said to us, by, uh, through the Holy Spirit, the power is going to come on us, and we're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, let me go to Samaria. I want to be the first one there. He wasn't a professional. He hadn't done any of this in the past, but God prompted him to go spread the gospel right in Samaria because he's truth and he's he is worthy of 
preaching. And you notice this is where in verse 6 it says, And the crowds, what happened? With one accord paid attention to what was being said. This is what I see in that passage. Christ was central to getting attention because he is worthy. Too often Christians try to have some kind of uh, event or, or some type of thing that draws attention. Some churches uh, do all these gimmicks to gr draw attention. Listen, the greatest attention getting uh, thing you can do is just present Jesus. Because when you speak truth to the needs of people, that's enough to grab attention. He just spoke. And it says in the crowd, with, paid attention to what was being said. What was Peter saying about Jesus? It was great. And then what took place? When they heard what was being said by him, and then they saw the signs that he did. Jesus is worthy. He spoke as having one authority. He spoke about Christ. And, and, and people were drawn to Jesus because of the truth. Christ was also central to the healing of the souls and the bodies because Christ is power. Verse 7, for unclean spirits crying out loud with a voice came out of many, of who, who, uh, many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. When he just presented Jesus, when he, when he showed the, the glory of God, people were being healed physically and, uh, and, and the demons were being uh, uh, taken out of them and they were being converted to Jesus. Philip. A man who would just sit in the pew said, all right, I'll go. Here am I. Send me. When righteous Samarians saw the, the glory of God. And lastly, this is what takes place when the people in the pew stand up and they go share their faith. And, and they preach the truth and they show his worth and, and he, he reveals his power. Verse 8, and there was much, uh, much, what does it say in your translation? There's a lot of joy. There was much or great joy joy in that city. You want joy in your community? You want joy in your family? You want joy when you go places? Preach Jesus and see how Jesus brings the joy. Because this world promises much and delivers very little. You can always find something on an infomercial that will bring you joy. And it's worthless. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew who you were speaking to, you'd be asking him. He'd give you water, living water, and you wouldn't thirst again. There's an overflowing joy when you know Jesus. When hearts are healed, when the power of God is evident, when the word of God is proclaimed, understood, and embraced, joy rings out and has a ripple effect in our world. It is time that we are all in with our life, with our love, and with our Lord, wherever you may call us.